Today is April 24th and I'm reading from Acts chapter 9. Now, this is the, uh, the incredible conversion of uh, Saul, who will become the Apostle Paul. Uh, Saul, we're introduced in the first verses, he's, he's continuing his threat and his uh, attack against the church. In fact, the word is murder against the disciples of the Lord. So uh, if he found any that were of, notice how it says, the way, then uh, he brought them bound to Jerusalem. So he had a mission of which to snuff out these early followers of the way, Jesus Christ. So as he's taking and on his journey uh, to Damascus, uh, the Bible tells us that suddenly there was this incredible light uh, that uh, radiated from heaven. And uh, it says that Paul, Saul, fell to the ground. And not only did he fall to the ground because of the brilliance of the light, but he heard a voice, and the voice was saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now, this is the first encounter that Paul, Saul has had with God. And uh, his first response is, who are you, Lord? It's kind of an interesting statement because he's basically acknowledging he doesn't know who this is, yet he refers to him as Lord, although we know that that is, re uh, is a reverence uh, you know, master type of a reference. Uh, yet at the same time, it seems to be that he recognizes this is more than just a man. And he says, who are you, Lord? And um, the response is, I'm Jesus. I'm the one that you've been persecuting. And then the Bible says that in verse uh, six, he's trembling and he's astonished. And he says, Lord, what do you want me to do? Boy, I'll tell you, what a change of heart as from one who'd been trying to accuse those who loved, believed in Jesus to now saying, what do you want me to do? And um, now the Bible says in verse 7 that the men who were with him stood speechless. That tells me they, they something was happening that they were picking up on. In fact, they heard a voice, but they didn't see anyone. So you can imagine this impact that it must have had on them. Now, Paul gets up from the ground, but he's now blinded. Maybe from the brightness of the light, whatever, but he can no longer see. And they lead him by his hand and they bring him to Damascus. And he's three days he cannot see and he didn't eat and he didn't drink. And you can understand why. This had such a profound impact upon his life. This was no little ordeal. This changed him to the very core. Now, Ananias, one of the early uh, followers of Jesus and the disciples, was, uh, was uh, at Damascus. And the Lord says to him, Ananias, in a vision, says to him, uh, Ananias, and he says, here I am, Lord. See, I'm saying so many cases where it's angels or it's, uh, you know, the, uh, the visitations, that, but this is a vision or a dream. And uh, he says, okay, here I am. And the Lord says, hey, I want you to go uh, to a certain street. It's called Straight Street. And I want you to go to a certain house. Uh, and, um, uh, and, and uh, the house of Judas, in fact, gives him the name. And I want you to call uh, for Saul of Tarsus. Uh, and, and, and so isn't it amazing the specifics here? This is, this is obviously uh, God giving specific instructions. I'd love to get this. And I think we're going to see us, ourselves return to this, where we get such specific instructions that it's unquestionable that this is the Spirit of God. So uh, he gives them the address, tells them who the person is that lives there, and tells them Saul's there. That's pretty remarkable. But he says this then, there in verse 11, Behold, he is praying. Isn't that something that the, the reference that God makes about Saul at this point is he, he's there, and behold, he's praying. Wow. Uh, wouldn't it be something that God would say, hey, go, go see so-and-so, he's praying. I, I mean, so he's seeking God. He's really been stirred about this. So, and, uh, and he says in a vision, he's seen a man named Ananias. So Saul also, while he's praying, has a vision of his own. And the vision is he's being told of a man named Ananias that's going to be coming to him, going to put his hands on him, and he's going to receive his sight. So you can see how God is coordinating all of this. There's no half chance. It's, it's, all, uh, it's all God's saying, God's doing. And, and they're following the lead of the Spirit. Now it takes faith because they still had to act on this. And you can see that it would take faith because Ananias says, God, I mean, you're talking about a man who has done much harm and to the saints in Jerusalem. And, um, and uh, he has authority to put it. So you can understand, it takes, even though you've had a vision, even though you've given specifics about street and house and where to go, you can understand that he's wrestling with faith here. And, and yet the Lord says to him, hey, he's, Saul's a chosen vessel. Um, 
he's mine, and, I, and I, he's going to be uh, tremendous in leading many people to Jesus. So Ananias goes, he goes into the house. What does he say? He says, Brother Saul. Isn't that neat? He's, he's affirming he's in the church, okay? He's affirming that indeed he's had a heart change. And he says, listen, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road uh, as you came, uh, uh, he, he's, he has sent me to the, lay hands on you that you might receive your sight and, listen, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So Saul's been converted, right? And uh, he's now praying. He receives a vision. Ananias comes, lays hands on him. He receives his sight, and he receives the Holy Spirit, and he was baptized. Now, so, uh, uh, and, and then it says, and when he had received food, he was strengthened, and Paul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. Would that not have been quite the meeting as he mingled with the followers of Jesus. And here's this notorious uh, accuser or uh, destroyer of the church. Well, what does the Bible say in verse 20? Immediately Saul, Paul now, preaches Christ. Immediately he preached Christ in the synagogues, in the very places that he had received his assignments to go persecute a church. Now he's there preaching Jesus to the one that he had previously been um, persecuting. And, uh, and it says that all that heard were amazed. And they're saying, uh, isn't this the one who destroyed those who called on his name in Jerusalem? I mean, it's, this, is, this is one of those conversions that rock a city. Because they're saying, now, is this, you know, this is impossible. It's like the worst notorious sinner coming to Christ and, and saying, boy, there is a God. That's what was happening right here. Well, now we see that uh, the tables are turning. And now the ones that had previously directed Saul are coming after Saul and verse uh, 23 now after many days had passed the Jews plotted to kill him now, this is just the, the the par for the course right if you're going to be a follower of Jesus said they they killed me they're going to want to kill you so uh, in verse 26 Saul had come to Jerusalem and there he joins the disciples and look what it says, and they were afraid of him and did not believe that he was a disciple. Sometimes it's hard when you see someone who's been some notorious, you know, evil, wicked, vile person, and you have doubts, and that's human nature. And this is where faith comes into play. They had to come catch up with what God had already been doing. And it's not unusual for us to struggle with these kind of emotions and battle these kind of feelings. But uh, look what happened, verse 7. There was always somebody, it's Barnabas. Barnabas, in fact, his name means son of encouragement. And Barnabas took Paul and he brought him to the apostles. And, and he shares with them uh, the story of Saul's conversion and, uh, and, and how he's beginning to speak boldly now uh, about the name Jesus and so they embrace him and they receive him. God sends some more Barnabases. I want to be a Barnabas that takes and helps to bridge the gap between those that believe and those who are struggling with doubt. And then <clears throat> verse 31, it says, Then the church throughout Judea uh, had peace and were edified, uh, walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit were multiplied. Here the church is surging, it's growing. These remarkable conversions, these remarkable experiences, all the experiences, angelic visitations and visions and dreams and signs and wonders, all for the purpose of pointing people to Christ. So, Aeneas there in verse uh, 32, it's interesting that there was a certain man, uh, uh, Aeneas, uh, who had been bedridden for eight years and was paralyzed. And Peter goes up to him and says, hey man, uh, Jesus the Christ heals you. I'm, it's, it's fascinating to me how many times they didn't really pray. They just did what Jesus said. Jesus said, uh, go heal the sick. And, and so they just say, hey, Jesus heals you. And it says immediately um, he's restored and, uh, and he's healed. And then finally, uh, a woman dies. Her name is, is Dorcas. Uh, and uh, there, there's a funeral procession, and they're crying, and they're weeping, and they're looking at all the things that are going on. And uh, Peter, he comes in, he's looking at these things, but he puts, and look at it in verse uh, 40. He puts them all out and, uh, and, and knelt down, and he prays. And uh, he turns to the body, and he, and he says to her, Arise. And, uh, and it says that she opened her eyes. 
and she saw Peter, she sat up. Now, I don't know about you, but that's quite a stretch. You know, a, a dead woman, and Peter goes in there. The same Peter that had struggled and agonized and wrestled over who Jesus was and denied him and all that. Here he is now, daring to stand before a dead corpse, knelt down, prayed, arise. She gets up, opens her eyes, sits up. My, 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 how God was moving in such a remarkable way. And I think when I look at this, I realize that uh, God wants to use it. In fact, the fact, last verse says, many believed on the Lord uh, when they saw these tremendous things that were happening. Uh, I think that we are in danger of limiting God. I mean, it's easy in our day to say, well, that was back then, but, you know, this is a different day. Do we believe in the impossible? Do we believe the words of the scripture? Is there anything that's too difficult for the Lord? Well, I want to say, I want to live in that expectancy. And I want to learn, I want to, I'd love to return to New Testament standard of daring to be, believe God for whatever he wants to do through my life, but a New Testament standard of believing that the most unexpected person can come to Jesus. Hey, may the Holy Spirit use you today to touch a life.